Hi, this is Austin Wilcox uh, with Kestrel Ballistics. I'm the product manager for Kestrel Ballistics. Today we're doing a new Facebook Live, um, taking advantage of all being stuck in our homes. Um, I'm here talking with Eduardo Abril de Fontcuberta. He is um, very prominent in King of Two Mile, and we wanted to take this opportunity to, to talk to him. Um, I think more of our shooters are more familiar with long range hunting or competitive shooting like PRS or NRL. Um, and really wanted to get a chance to, to hear from someone who has experience beyond that range, for someone who's doing the King of Two Mile exercises um, and competitions. So Eduardo, I'll let you introduce yourself. Um, you can say who you are and real fast what your background is. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I, actually, you did very good. My name is very difficult to, to, <laughs> to pronounce and you did, you did very good. So, so my thumbs up for that. Thank you. Okay, my name is Eduardo de Concuberta. I was born in Spain. And my background is military sniping. I've been more than 30 years training snipers in, uh, uh, and shooting far. And also as a competitive shooter with a 50. And then I started the King of Two Miles and it all exploded. Basically, I, I, was, I have been shooting as far as my, my rifles could shoot for more than 25 years. And I knew exactly how far we could get with the equipment we had at the time. So I was seeing all those videos we had back in, 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 in 15. You realize that those videos have faded away. You don't see those videos like a 308 shooting 4,000 yards anymore. Now it's real people doing real stuff because of the reality of going to competitions, having competitions, and really proving what you can do with your rifle, either a 6.5, or uh, in Priet Lapua, and, and of course the big boys, the 50s, 375 Tag, or 16 Barrett, and the 460 Star. Now you can go to competitions and you can prove how difficult it is. You should actually the, the world record, three out of three on a 39 inch or 36 inch target, uh, is only all just over 2,000 yards. That is a proof of how difficult it is. Wow. All right. Um, so talk to me a little bit about King of Two Mile. I've seen posts on Facebook. I've seen snippets, you know, pictures of the guys holding the guy up on the chair, carrying him around with a crown on his head. But talk to me about the, the mechanics of what happens at a King of Two Mile event. Um, what's, what are the shooters trying to accomplish? Actually, what, what we try to do is, uh, is we started the, the, the competition world of ELR, extreme world world. First, we didn't even have an name for it. It was just the King of Two Miles. And at the King of Two Miles, we start shooting a one mile, cold bore, and then we shoot as far as we can. Right now, we are at two miles, but we may get farther out. Eventually, when people start hitting it consistently, which has not happened. Uh, right now, last year, we couldn't hit the two mile target. The King didn't hit the two mile target. So we, are, we saw, still have some work to do. But the, the performance of the shooters right now, after uh, nearly five years of, of competition, has improved incredibly, exponentially. The first year, we gathered shooters to try and find out if we could shoot uh, that far. We couldn't get much over 2,000 yards. Now, most of the top shooters are proving first-round hits. At, at my, I mean, maybe 20 guys shoot first-round hits at one mile cold board. That's very impressive. Very, very impressive. And th this, that's because th there has been a, a big movement of very smart shooters, very smart uh, uh, manufacturers of guns, uh, calibers, rifles, optics, casseroles, working hard to pursue the goal of shooting two miles or as far as we can. And that's, that's basically the goal. Uh, there are many ways to skin a cat, and there are people trying to do it with light rifles, People trying to do it with heavier rifles, and all of them try to be the king. And the king is just a guy that shoots farther out and hits the target more consistently, up to two miles. Gotcha. So I think I've seen in the events, it looks like the results, I've seen results posted. It looks like you have a larger pool of shooters, and you're kind of shooting at progressively longer targets, and there's some kind of a whittling down of shooters, and then you have fewer and fewer guys. Does everyone get a chance to try and shoot the larger, longer targets, or is it only the yeah, people sure. who are able to? Actually, actually, we used, we, uh, we used to do it, we had a lot of shooters. We had over 
over uh, 200 uh, uh, registrations for just like 70 slots. So we had to, and there's a lot of limitations. Once you get very far, the camera systems, the ranges, it, it's not easy to, to set up, to get a set up for two, shooting two miles. So there's a lot of logistics issues. Then we couldn't allow the, the shooters to, to shoot as much as they, can, as they could because it was very frustrating on the first editions. They kept shooting and shooting and shooting and missing and missing. It was very frustrating. So we decided to make qualification days. And those qualification days, basically, if you miss a target more than, more than a certain amount of shots, you were out. Okay. That, that, that means that the guys that really have done their homework and they bring the stuff together, they could advance and keep shooting from the first target and on. And the top, uh, the top uh, 10 at the beginning, we are getting a little more into the finals, get to shoot the finals. On a different on a different type of event, the finals is a you have the, we have a certain amount of rounds and it's a timed event. So basically, you keep shooting until either you run out, run out of rounds or you run out of time. So the qualification will run it a little different for uh, than we do on the finals. Right now, the people are getting so good that we can actually uh, move along and start doing the same process we did on the finals, like time event, shoot as much as you can, and keep going until you get to two miles, we, can, we will be able to do it, uh, to do it also on the qualification. Okay. And two miles was very yeah. difficult. Yeah. I understand it's not so much a single shooter. It's not like in a no. standard it's, PRS it's a, match. Actually, You've got a team. It's, a team. it's a team event. That's something that we need to talk also. This is not a single shooter. It's nearly impossible to shoot alone two miles so i only i mean i've been doing this for 30 years and i i i'm the match director i, I stand with all the teams on there i only know one guy that i've seen that was able to do it ever <laughs> and it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a really experienced guy uh, and he has been doing this forever and he's able to shoot without a spot but all the other humans like me we need a very good spotter, so basically it's a team event. You need a spotter, a shooter, and you need the help of, of the spotter to see your impact. Is it usually a two-man team then, or do you sometimes have yeah, more people it, on it used to be, we used to have a three-man team, but we, we started to see professional spotters instead of, and uh, we, we reduced that to two men, so it was actually, we came back to the basics. At the beginning, the skill of the spotters was lacking, so we needed to add spotters to the teams. Right now, the spotters are becoming becoming good. So actually, we can go back to the original idea, which is a shooter and a spotter, uh, and they 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 can actually among the two get the job done. Okay. Where was the first King of Two Mile competition, and when was that? It was in in fifteen, and it it has been always uh, be located at the same place, NRA Whittington Center in Baton. In New Mexico, it's a fantastic range. Well, it's a world-class range uh, down there, and uh, we've been we've been very helpful because we won the, the world championship, uh, 50 cal competitions on there. And uh, when the idea came, I was I, I was uh, I was there, so I said, "Oh my God, let's talk about it." I got the support of uh, the 50 caliber shooters association, which uh, and then we could make it happen down there. First year, we were, it was just a, a few of us uh, shooting on what they call now the Barrett range, and then we developed a specific range for the two miles. Okay. Um, I think I've seen Facebook posts internationally with the King of Two Mile logo. So yep. it started there. Are there other matches within the US and then internationally, or is it just yes. that one in the US? Uh, this year, I mean, last year we started with two. We did actually one king of one mile. That's a variation we do for the countries that are starting. Uh, making these rifles take a long time and a lot of expense. In some places, they have to start somewhere. So we, we may also make a, a, like an entry level king of one mile that you can shoot with lighter rifles so you can get the sport started. And then uh, they, did, they did what? King of one mile in Argentina for all South American countries. And then we, we did a king of two miles in South Africa and France last year. 
And this year we had uh, we had seven competitions. Oh, but wow. I don't know with all what that is happening in the world right now, it could, it's getting a little complex. I don't know if we will be able to do to do all of them, but we are, we are trying. Okay. Are there other matches um, coming around? Like if somebody is interested in doing this, um, what are their opportunities in the U.S. Say if they're a U.S. Oh, shooter. Yeah. Do they do yeah, they have to go to that one location, or are there other local matches where they can no, kind of no, get we, a feel for it? We are, we are uh, there's from the uh, 50 caliber shooters association. We are an agency that we sanction matches. So basically, uh, right now uh, the the FCSA is running ELR matches, and there's other. We also have NRA, which is sanctioning records, and uh, I mean, may, I don't maybe like 10 or 12 competitions a year all around the US. So if you have a rifle and you want to shoot, you will have plenty of places to go. And shoot. Okay. Um, has there been pushback in some countries? I know that the yeah. U.S. has fairly yeah. relatively. Actually, we, we we had a big a big uh, a big problem in Canada right now. They passed a law uh, like last week, uh, limiting the the energy to ten thousand joules. Okay. That is basically this is the, the this is the most powerful rifle. That the Canadians will be able to shoot at least we have okay. last term. I mean, you can still uh, shoot the LR, you can, but of course, it's a limiting factor for them. Uh, I hope they can reverse that, those laws. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Canada's got a lot of open country. <laughs> really yeah, I mean, and actually, and very good shooters. Yeah. I mean, Rob Forland was uh, was organizing the King of Two Miles in Canada, and it was an international competition coming from all over the world. We have a fantastic. Uh, a uh, group of people on there, very experienced. Actually, the record, the record, uh, the sniper record right now, it's Canadian. Oh, yeah. They have a lot of experience shooting, shooting a few miles, and now they are limited. They cannot train with that. They cannot have those rifles. So let's see that they have like a two-year uh, time to adapt. I hope that they can reverse that illogical loss because basically, if somebody wants to do something wrong, they will do it with whatever gun. They I doubt There's they're going to use it with the King of Two Mile rifle. The thing's a little yeah, heavy to move around. I mean, you the, the amount of money and 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 time and effort that you have to devote to shoot two miles is totally contrary to the attitude of a delinquent or a bad guy. Yeah. It's a very good guy spending time and money for a sport. This is a sport, nothing else. Yeah. It's not even not a, a sniping. It's way different. Yeah. So. Uh, one of the questions, one of the reasons I was excited to talk to you. So I, I work for Kestrel, obviously. The thing that I have the most experience with is competitive long range shooting. Not that I'm going to go out and win any matches, but the world I understand is, you know, 6.5 Creedmoor, 6 millimeter caliber, shooting between 400 and 1200 yards from different position, positional. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I've got a 25 to 30 X scope probably. That's my world. That's what I understand. Um, I would love to hear from you if I'm starting from that place, if that's my understanding of long range shooting, what changes do I have to make in my equipment? Like, Where is my equipment going to fall down? When is that rifle no longer going to do the job? When is my ability to read wind going to fall flat for me? Um, what changes would I have to make in order to start doing well at King of Two Mile? Where does that transition occur? I, um, as I said before, I've been 30 years uh, training snipers, and uh, for the last two years, I've been running the Star Academy in Alabama in, uh, and for Star, for the, the rifleman. There, we train the shooters to shoot precision rifle and other, other platforms. But on my courses, I tell the people that the main goal you need to focus is to remove the unknowns. There's a lot of things you don't know about your platform, your rifle, your muscle velocity, your ballistic coefficients, your equipment. Those things you have to one by one identify them and remove them from the equation. So when you end up doing that and you have a, a good platform, a stable fundamentals because you've been shooting PRS, you're good, you have a good prone shooting, you're, you have good positional shooting, you understand how the rifle shoots, then it's just getting a little more obsessive on the small details that make a difference 
And if you learn a little more ballistics, you start to shoot, not focusing on the positional side or on the moving side, but shooting on the perfect shot every time. And all the things, environmental and technical aspects of your shooting, you can actually jump the next step of rifle shooting, which is EMI. So give me some examples. I think most guys that are shooting long range, they think they know what their what their unknowns are and they think they're working on those you know guys are getting their chronographs and they know their standard deviation of their ammo what's an example of one of the unknowns that an unknown unknown something that i don't know that i don't even know that i don't know that i'm gonna have to learn to figure out what you're talking about okay for example one thing i see all the time with the with the prs uh, guys which actually sniper world have the same mission is they don't realize that uh, Every shot is different from the previous one. You have to know not only the uh, basic table that you run, like a table on your on your paper, they plug it on, they stick it on the rifle, and that's the your table. Or even even a table run on a cash roll will be dynamic all the time. Those little subtle subtle differences in the wind, in the angles, even the way you hold the rifle will change because of the parallax, because of the cheek well, because of the recoil of course. Those little things that you can get away on, on PRS because the target is very big, when you go into very small targets, very far, they don't give you, you don't have any slack. So basically, if you have to become very obsessive on your fundamentals, on your muscle velocity, on your range, I mean, a difference of one yard at those distances can mean hitting the target from the top to the bottom. What kind of rangefinders? What kind of rangefinders are you using? I mean, rangefinders have a, a plus minus one or two yards. Yeah. Even even the top, like the Petronics, they have about one or two at two miles. So basically, even that little variation might get, get you off target. So the slack you have to get your ballistic right, to get your fundamentals right, is basically zero. You have to get out the perfect shot every time and have your ballistics dead on. You, you cannot allow a couple clicks to be somewhere. It's like two, two tenths. No, 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 we don't talk to tenths in the oh. arm. It's, you really have to find every click that you mix on the target. If you shoot a target at 700 yards and you hit it a little low, you're good. Here is, you hit the target. Targets are big. But if you hit a little, that little low on a, a one mile cold war, you won't hit the target. And if the main problem is if you don't hit the, you, you don't hit the target, you, and it's very difficult to have feedback, if you don't have a very good spotter, then you don't know what your impact is. How do you correct? Big problem. So basically, you cannot just trust to shoot, miss, and correct, which is a very typical attitude <laughs> in PRS. Forget about that. You need to strive for the cold bore shot every time. And removing the unknowns will give you the capability of having a cold bore every time at any distance of any condition. And that's the main difference. You cannot just shoot, correct, and adapt and move. No, no, no. You have to strive for the perfect shot based on the most sound fundamentals, incredible technology on the rifle, quality, and then get your ballistics right. And that's where the Kestrel comes in. Yeah. Without, um, you, you can you get away the without the Kestrel on PRX. <laughs> there are many people that don't have a Kestrel. You won't get away with uh, with NLR without the Kestrel and, and sound ballistics. You need it. Gotcha. So you said the targets are about 36 inches. That's the width of the target? No, basically the targets are variable. That's for the records, the record shots. Okay. Uh, the, they, they basically, uh, you, it has to be standardized. So it's been varying a little between 36 and 39. But the, basically, the, the basic idea at the beginning of two miles is shooting a target which is around a little over one minute. And the two mile target is around one point four minutes. I mean, it's, it's a steel target. Every time you move it around from year to year, it changes the subtension. 
So basically, yeah. it's not perfectly one minute or perfectly 1.2 minutes. So when you move it, you will have a little variation, but it's always around one point something. Okay. It's very it's just overall. I know like from PRS, it's usually one and a half to two minute targets. That's kind of where they generally keep them. Yep, and that's talking. 500, 600, 700. Yeah, because 36 sounds like a big target until you move it that far out. <laughs> yes, that's a problem. A 48, 48 by 60, which is the two mile target, you don't realize how small it is until you see it down there. <laughs> and you with a spotting scope, you say, oh, and actually, People would, I mean, there's some, if you go into the Facebook from Kingdom Two Miles, we have pictures of, uh, of the location of the targets looking down to the range. I would recommend that everybody goes down uh, into the Facebook and take a look at those pictures because when you look the mountain and you look the targets, it doesn't impress you so much that when you go around and you look at the valley and you see where you're shooting at and you say, Oh my God, you're really keeping this steel from there? <laughs> That's what impresses more. So go, go there, take a look. Because every time Walter Wilkinson, you know, the King of Two Mountains is, is a team basically of three people. Uh, Alec Kortzman, Walter Wilkinson, and me. And when he keep grapples the mountain hanging target, when you are there hanging the mountains and you look down and you see the valley, and you realize that people are out there finally looking at the target in that valley down there and they hit this steel which you are hanging that's what makes me happy <laughs> it is a cool feeling um i mean so from personal experience my longest shots 1800 yards of the 6.5 creedmoor i was you know, past that at 2000 i couldn't see impacts in the dirt we were having you know spotter we couldn't couldn't pull that one off but at, you know, 1800 yards i was able to do that you were showing me before we started the difference between the bullets. There's a you know Hornady six five Creedmoor, and this is a fantastic round. I love it. I, I first round hits at eighteen hundred yards. I cannot complain. Yep. You shouldn't be able to do that five years earlier. You wouldn't be able to do that. But you were showing me the the ammunition that you're shooting and kind of the the progression in your mind. How people go from from where I might be at. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so what caliber is that? What are you shooting at those matches? This is a four sixty style. Okay. And actually, this is, I mean, there's a lot of, of fuss because everybody has their own pet cartridge and they want to push the idea of 375 or 416 bar. Everybody has their own ideas of what will get to two miles reliable. And uh, I, I, I pushed the idea of the 416 star before I was shooting a 416 bar. So I, I have, I'm very good friends with all the Barrett family and I've been shooting Barrett forever. And, uh, they uh, they were shooting the 416, but I said, oh my God, I have this here at the factory in Austria. And uh, I look at it and say, this looks very, very promising. And uh, then I brought it, I, I started talking to people saying, hey, why don't we use it? And uh, we were lucky that some of the top guys making the bullets and, and, and uh, ammo got involved in, involved in it. Randy Powell pushed from Thunder Ammo, pushed, pushed the development of the, of the little angles and polish the design of the chamber and the throat. And now we have a, a caliber that is working very, very good and winning competition. So more people will make bullets. And that brings another point. The good thing about having the King of Two Miles is market interest. There's a lot of interest in the market for this type of equipment. So of course, manufacturers have to make a living by selling stuff. 10 years ago, I went to a manufacturer and told, hey, I want a barrel for the 50 cal in 112 or 111 twist, they will laugh at me. They would never do that. The answer was always the same. Everybody shoots 115. Now you go and say, hey, I want a 50 cal 112. And they will say, how many you, you need? <laughs> same thing with the 6.5 and with the 308. 308, the old days, we only have 112 and 110. Right now, you have 1.8, 1.9, everything, because of shooting far. You play with the bullets, you play with the, with the barrel twist, you play with a lot of stuff, because there's a market to sell them. And that's because of the excitement of the people and, uh, and getting people involved in this, spending their money. In the end, if there's not a market for something, it will never, ever happen. And that's the good thing about PLR and 
the long run should it, it has created a market that the companies will make uh, good money making stuff and they will get excited, they will improve it and they will make more. And in a few years, there will be a market for new rifles, new barrel manufacturing uh, processes, new optics, things that will allow us to shoot that market. It's amazing how far the market, I mean, I've been doing long range for five, six years now, I think. And just in that time, just seeing how much change has come to the manufacturers, what they're willing to produce and the quality they're able to produce. Um, it's night and day from even six years ago. Um, so it's night and day. in that round, what, what's the, describe that round for me. So for a hand loader, like how many, how many grains is the bullet? Is that a monolithic bullet? Is that a, a turned yes. bullet? Basically most guys up there, uh, shoot solids because of basically because you can make them easier you don't have to in, engage in swaging and all that stuff you can really play with the prototypes and see and they are more consistent so basically all most of the I, mean, I wouldn't say all but most of the guys that shoot in the round shoot solid bullets. and uh, they are they come from all different designs you you uh, there's many I, I only shoot two types of bullets which is basically basically the Thunder Ammo and the Cutting Edge. And basically, there are Badlands and many other people out there making solid bullets. They cut them, they design them, people uh, test them. And basically, they, they all have the different ideas. Some, some want a very high DC, some want a more stable flight, even if the trade off is a little lower BC, uh, like this one. And uh, it's all depending on the shooter. So basically now we have the capability of designing our own bullets with our own performance uh, requirements. Some people just want more stability to fly subsonic if they want to side, uh, shoot very far. Some other people are going to shoot a very, very high BC bullet that may not be as, as stable one, once they get to subsonic. So it, it's all a balance between what you want to do, how to do it. So. It's very exciting to see people pushing uh, one type of bullet and then people shooting a totally different design and, uh, and having them compete on the same competition and see how they come out. Where, where are those rounds going subsonic? So the, these rounds, you're shooting two miles, you know, it's around, what would that be, uh, 3,400 yards? 3,500. 3, yeah, so they're supersonic, the, the whole yeah. two miles? Wow. We are supersonic at two miles. <laughs> and this is and this this round is designed to be stable. It's not a super high BC bullet. It is designed to be super stable because our goal is not to stay at two miles, it's to shoot more. And yeah. uh, so we push it harder. And uh, I, if you have the horsepower to push it to two miles supersonic, then I want to keep going farther out. And it's, it, I mean, as I say, it's a, it's a different, some people just want a super high DC, that's the only thing they look when they get a ball. Some people want the stability. And uh, over the years, they develop their own experiences and the way they, they think, it's, uh, it's the better way to win the competition. So it's, it's a matter of, of personal preference and experience and the way they shoot. I personally want to shoot a stable bullets. So basically, I, I would rather trade a little bit more BC. This this is this has a BC of 440 something. It's not super high, and uh, there are bullets out there that have way higher. But this bullet will fly forever. So, what's the bullet weight? How many grains? 615, and you push. We can push it to 33, 3350. Okay, wow. So yeah, it's, that's a big, big actually, wow. this is my this is my own load, and this is the 576. It is the old uh, 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 charge, and this is 3250. Okay. And uh, and the new loads for 2020 that they are they are testing, Randy is testing. It's a 615 bullet with a higher BC, and they're pushing it at the same speed. So basically, it will be even more super sharp. I don't I don't have a number, but very impressive. So tell me about the scopes. Oh, yeah. sorry. Uh, no, but there are other calibers also. I mean, you you don't have to get one of these to win the King of Two Miles because it's it's a puzzle. There's a friend, one of uh, the top shooters in the world, Gino Axic, says painted his rifle with a puzzle because it really all the little pieces have to match, and you have to get all your stuff together in one 
fails, everything crumbles. So basically, uh, the rifle is just one piece of the puzzle. The optics is another piece. The, the having a good torso, having uh, a good uh, uh, sound uh, uh, muscle velocity reading, uh, having controlling the wind, everything comes together. So basically, if, if there are many, you can win with a 375 jet. It doesn't, it doesn't as long happen. As, long as, as long as your system is consistent. Of course, and you, are, and you and your team are consistent. Because people get obsessed with equipment, and I would say that it's not more like the equipment, it's more like the whole team and your equipment and your fundamentals, how you talk, how, how you log. People forget about the logs, and it's very, very, very... Uh, wait a minute, can you put it in the I have I have the sun in my face, and I, can, I barely see the screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, yeah? So, okay. So, talk about scopes. So, um, like better. Now I see the screen. Better. Better. Okay. Okay. Talk better. about the, the optics. I couldn't see the screen. <laughs> okay. Talk to me about the optics that you're using. Uh, most times okay. in a PRS okay. match, you're using something with a 30, 25 x magnification. What? Uh, are, what what's different? How do you? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm just, what is, what is different about your equipment when you go from shooting 1200 yards to, you know, 3000 yards, what, what do you need to do differently? Uh, you can, I mean, the last, last year, King of Two Miles, no, sorry, the, the year before, Robert, he won with a, with a scope that basically most people uh, would all consider like a super expensive. So it's just another piece of it. It has to be a good quality scope with, with the amount of, uh, of elevation that you need for your system and set, set it up and know it the right way. For example, I personally only shoot two, two types of, of the competition, which is loophole and transmission. And normally it's always all around 30, 30 power, 30, 30 power. I normally don't use all that much, but it's good to have it there if the, if the, if the mirage is okay. If the wind is okay, and you can actually get benefits from having a, a scope with that amount of power. Of course, most of the time, the trade-off is elevation. And that's a big problem. We need a lot of elevation. And yeah, what's the elevation uh, for a shot at that range? Uh, our, our, we need around 40 millirads okay. in my rifle. Are you able to do that with a base, like a 20 MOA base? Do you get like just a 30 or 40 MOA base? Or yeah. what, do you, what do you do? Basically, basically we, can shoot, we can shoot two miles without just getting a zero around 1,400 or 1,500. The whole idea is, is, is that with that zero, you can actually have a two mile shot at 33 millirads, 34. So you can do it with the scope. You, I mean, actually, I use the same scope for my ELR-22 rifle, which is in, with this, with the Charlie, I don't know if you're aware of the yeah, Charlie. Prisms. It's becoming, yeah. and basically, without, before the Charlie, we had a lot of issues with the elevation. And now it makes your life way easier because if you wrap now with elevation, you can stick it up, and you can stick it in front, and then you recover a certain amount. In this case, I recovered 25 mils. And that makes a big difference because now I can shoot nearly 50. And we explain real fast what that is. Anything like explain real fast what Sorry? that Charlie is. Explain real, what, what is okay, the Charlie? Actually, explain that real fast. Okay, basically this is a Charlie unit. It is, a, I don't know if you can see it from here. Look, I will put it on the camera. Actually, I think you will be able to see it. If I put it on the camera, you will see that the image Times. Okay, look. Yeah. Did you see it? I can see that it's got, it's a little hard from here, but I can tell it has you mirrors see, inside of it. If, but when you get into the image, you will see that the, the image, look. I don't know if the camera is able to focus there. So basically, what it, what it is, it, it will give you 25 or, or a certain amount. You can, you can adjust it to any kind of elevation. A certain amount of elevation that you can plug in in front of your scope. So basically, if you check, for example, I don't know if 
can you see from there? I can I can put a rifle here and you will yeah. see it. You see from it? Yeah. Yeah. You, you just get the rifle and put it in front. Now you have 25 extra millimeters. Wow. So then you can get your 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 scope, you can remove 25 from the turret and go start all over. So you, it's now with this uh, with this system, which is basically standard for most CLR shooters, you can actually shoot around 26, 30 on the scope plus plus this. So it's very very convenient. There's also adjustable base that you can you, that you can use. The adjustable bases basically do the same thing, but adjusting adjusting the the elevation on uh, on the base. And uh, those are fixed. Some are fixed, like like the one I have on my 22. Some are movable, which are like uh, like these ones. That you have a you have a an adjustable an adjustable on a micrometer in the back, and also an, another one which is the newest model, which is like this one that you can adjust it. Can so you have. You you will get the, the amount of elevation that you don't get on the scope because you run out of it from that system. Either the base or the Charlie or all, all combined. Gotcha. All right. Um, is there anything else, I guess, that if, uh, if I was to come out um, and try King of Two Mile, um, you would say I would need to adjust about my, my setup. I would I get a Charlie. I'm, I get a larger caliber. I've seen the rifles are a lot bigger. The, the barrels are a lot thicker. Um, the, the bipods you use are a little bit different design. They're not for rapid deployment. It looks like they're more kind of a, a setup. And uh, the bipods were a big issue in the past because we didn't have any big bipods. Actually, if you have to if you need a six degree angle to shoot the two mile target and uh, the rifle is long, it's very, very difficult to get uh, your bipod your bipod high enough. Imagine it in the front. Then if you use systems like like uh, the the extender, the bipod extender, that you extend up your bipod to the front, then you also need a longer bipod. So basically we didn't have those bipods two years ago. So people started using bipods from S class. Now we are going back, there's a lot of very good designs on market and uh, folding bipods. So I, I think that the bipods are, are very, 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 very good. Right now we are getting even more models of folding bipods that get you the elevation that you need. And they're rough and strong enough for a rifle that weighs uh, 40 pounds, which is the maximum weight for the King of Kumar. So it, there's a big, big difference in, uh, in the way we handle bipods this year than, the, than we used to do it before because of the lack of good bipods that we had there. Now we have them and we are moving to the normal bipods. Okay. Um, you've talked a little bit about using a Kestrel and I'll just real fast um, explain maybe for the users. You know, the Kestrels, we have different models. Um, for shooting King of Two Mile, I would say you'd want to use something that is going to be using the Doppler generated beat or generated drag curves or bullet files. Um, in this case, you'd want to be using either the Kestrel Elite with applied ballistics or the Kestrel with Ford off using the Hornady Ford off um, calculator. Both of those are able to use Doppler generated data um, and the AB side, the custom curve and the Hornady's, the bullet files. Um, so they're both gonna be able to give you accuracy at extreme long range. Um, mm -hmm. You know, then there, beyond that, there's some differences between the units as far as where they'd be applicable in other scenarios. But I think just for taking a handful of shots at extreme long range, either of those would probably be able to cut it for you. Um, Talk to me real fast about the the ways you use a Kestrel in King of Two Mile. Okay, the first thing that everybody has to understand is one of the big unknowns is the met, the, the met of the, of your shots, basically the meteorological conditions of and the wind. I won't I, I won't say that you have to stand measuring the winds at the King of Two Miles for many reasons. And you are a PRS guy, and, and you know what I'm talking about. The wind here is not the wind at all. Yeah, and but two, two miles is very cool to learn. You you train yourself to shoot in the wind every time you shoot with the Kestrel. That that is what gives you the the, the experience of uh, 
of this is this wind and what it does down there. And when you place a target, you see the difference between the wind there. So you're always going around with your test hole measuring the wind. That gives you a, a, an experience that will help you on, on those far shots, which are basically impossible to predict in regards to the wind. The other, that was the start of the test hole before we had ballistics on. Now we have ballistics and we have some of the top uh, ballistic apps or, or solvers in, in, embedded in the system. And uh, now you can do both things without having to change uh, your hardware, which is a big issue for many people. Uh, you can actually just use a smartphone app if you're a PRS guy, and, uh, but then you also need a Kestrel. So basically, why not just go with a Kestrel that has the software in it and you don't have to go around changing two different, two different units. Uh, of course, some people still rely on their own uh, ballistic software for whatever reason. They say that they're, they're a solver and they prefer to use like uh, an app, a smartphone app or whatever, that's fine. But many other people uh, say, okay, if I can have everything, a good solver and a good solution on my kessel, on the firing line, and now that you have the HUD, it's even more convenient. Because you have it on the rifle and it's super, super convenient. Why, why complicate yourself more? So that's the main goal. What you get from the Kestrel with ballistics, either the 4 or or the Elite with the AB, both are super good uh, solvers, is the capacity of having in one unit without having to complicate yourself with only one input system, which is one of the most, uh, 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 let's say, one of the biggest problems with so with solvers is input input error. So having one system only reduces the amount of possibilities that of you screwing yourself by input error while on the line. So have one system, run it, and uh, that's the best way to advance yourself. Once you're shooting like with a PRS like one mile to get the next step. Uh, get a system that is sound and especially robust from the software side. So basically that's what I, I would say people. If you, if you want to very specialized stuff, uh, you may find more interest uh, in, in a specialized, a specialized soft software. But if you're a typical guy that shoots bullets out there from Berger, from Hornady, that want I mean, go to the systems that have greater data embedded already on the system which is basically the, the Kestrel with AB, which, is, uh, which has a huge amount of uh, Raider uh, custom drag models and for the OF that also have a class a lot of them. Yeah. One time um, I was thinking back, uh, just for a personal exercise, I was using the Kestrel and I was kind of trying to see, okay, uh, what ranges does a change in temperature have? What size impact? And I did it probably like 700 yards at 1500 yards and at 2000 yards and just saying, okay, I'm going to change my temperature by five degrees or by 10 degrees. And at each of those distances kind of chart out how much change happened to my solution. And, you know, and we tell people at a PRS match every hour, every half hour, maybe between stages, update your temperature. But a lot of times that's probably overkill at the ranges of, you know, 700 yards, 600 yards. It doesn't make you can have a 10 degree change in difference and it's not going to be a night and day difference. I think that's why people can get away using things like the app that's pulling weather from an airport yeah. 20 miles away. It's, it makes a difference, but it doesn't make enough of a difference for things to break down. But it was very interesting to me to see, OK, yeah, it's, it's 700 yards. I can get away with a lot. At 1500 yards, now I have to be a little more careful. But if I'm trying to do something at King of Two Mile, I can have no margin of error. I was shocked how, how much of a difference, even like one degree of temperature had on my solution at those ranges. And it actually, I was like, you know, how, how, do, how do you guys handle having that small margin of error? Obviously the Kestrel I think is a great tool for that. It's got the external thermistor, it's measuring temperature right where you're at. But my guess is you guys, you know, what is the approach? How do you guys handle having that small of an envelope that you can play in to get accurate data? Okay, when, you, when we started talking, you remember I said, remove the unknowns. I mean, what kills you is all those little things that you didn't measure. 
I measure everything, everything, every time, every shot. Of course, you have to be obsessive on lowering your SD, lowering the, the variances on your rifle, knowing exactly uh, how your clicks are. How many people uh, do tests to, come to check that their scopes are actually elevating when they plug in 25 millirads or 100 minutes to make sure that they have less than 1% error? How many people do that? You need to do that if you go to the alarm because that 1% will add up with all the other errors that you cannot control and will mean a difference. You won't hit the target. The laser ring finder. You need a very good laser range finder because if you have one that has two or three yards error, you're gonna miss the target. The, the amount of precision that you need to do everything in your shooting is so high that any little problem, I mean like DA, for example, DA changes all the time, all the time. And most people that are shooting ELR are not shooting uh, DA anymore. Why? Because it has three inputs that vary the, the result. So basically, if you follow the DA, you're going to drive yourself crazy. So you separate the whole thing. Ballistics become more like a, like a system that you have to control. So you keep your SD under control, your muscle velocity under control, become obsessive with those things, be sure that your range is correct, and start playing with the little variances in your ballistics. Every time you shoot, your round has a different velocity and by definition, a different ballistic condition. So it's always a little tricky. You have to study ballistics, you have to be very fluent with the way bullets fly, stability, and know what you can do and what will push you out of the target because you will have to make compromise. The wind is there always and it's very difficult to fight the wind. So you have to remove all those little things from your system so the only thing that will actually be up against you is the wind. And that's more than enough that you will hit the target. <laughs> so talk to me about that. I mean, when I shoot, I can, I know that, you know, a five mile an hour wind will kind of start pushing me back on my heels a little bit. I'm not the world's best wind reader. When I shoot, I usually try and get in a clear location where I can get clean air, measure with the Kestrel, see what it tells me. I look down range and say, does it look like it's blowing about the same there as it is here? Do I need to add a little take a little off? But it's not a very exact science. Again, you know, my, my first round hit <laughs> capability is not the world's best at this. Um, when you're shooting King of Two Mile, obviously the Kestrel is me measuring wind at your location. At shorter ranges, you can use that as a good starting point. At the ranges you're shooting, how do you use how do you use a Kestrel to handle the wind? How do you handle the wind on a shot of that length? In the competition, you don't really have to use it. You use it for training. You need to learn how to shoot in the wind by staying all your life, looking at the, at the trees, at the grass, at the mirage, and keep checking and checking and checking and checking and seeing, oh my God, this is what the mirage does like this. Under, when it goes on a valley, when it goes down the valley, when you have to become very, very uh, obsessive in trying to get a very good spot in scope and focusing on the little uh, mirage and all those little things, the little, those little clues that will give you uh, the possibility of saying, okay, I have like five miles per hour on this flat land on my first thousand yards, but then it's climbing on the mountain going up and depending on where the wind comes, it's gonna, gonna uh, help your bullet climb them. So you will have to take that into account then it's going in the mountain turns around, so you're going to have a different way, a different way of that area. So you have to make yourself in your mind uh, a plan on what the wind is going to do. Then you put all that into ballistics, into your software, and then you shoot, and hopefully you get you get a fair ground hit, which is difficult, of course. The the best your spotter is. And the best your, your shooting is in regards of seeing your trace, watching the, the maximum um, ordinate, because the bullet is going up and it's not, it's so, going so, so far high that if you're looking at the target, you won't see the flight of your bullet. It's way going over. So basically, you have to look at the bullet, not the target, to see the trace, and it will help you with those little things. All those little tricks come in training. It, it's 
I mean, the, the, you know that 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 uh, saying that that say, says uh, when the music starts uh, uh, sounding, it's not the right moment to start learning how to dance. It's the same thing. You have to learn how to dance with the castro, with the wind. Every day you go to the rink. Every shot you took that you didn't spend some time blowing. I mean, actually, going to play the targets is the best condition to play with the wind. I mean, to play with the wind, to learn from the wind. Because you are on the firing line, you check the wind, then you go walking and you, you check the wind, you place the target and you check the wind. And you see, oh my God, analyze what is going on. Learn from every shot. That's what makes a huge difference in how you're shooting with a dance. Don't let guess. That's why I don't like the, the shoot and correct attitude. Because they forget all this previous effort in getting first round hits. You have to learn even from placing the targets. That's a huge amount of information you can learn from that. And that's information you will plug it in into your solver, and then you will make an educated guess of what the wind is. Not shoot and say, ah, it's going to be around four miles per hour. There's no more around anything in your life. You have to say, it's going to be four here, six from a different uh, direction there, and then seven from a different direction on that area. So all that component becomes this. You input that number, and then you will be very close or keep it on. Yeah, I guess the best tool, the, the Kestrel holster to keep it on your belt at all times so you don't forget it, take Actually, it with you everywhere. I, I, I keep it in my pocket all the time. <laughs> it's, it's, I never had one of those holsters. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, all right. So you actually do a fair bit of teaching um, people to shoot ELR. You, you have yes. classes that you teach. Talk to me about those classes. What you, what's your curriculum? What do you do with the students? Okay, basically, basically what... Uh, I like I like to to train uh, shooters. And where are those students starting typically? Where do they where do they come to you? Are they brand new? Or are they where are they there, shooting? We at? have I mean, we have introductory courses in precision uh, rifle shooting, which is uh, which is uh, the number one, which is basically six hundred yards. And uh, you wouldn't believe how people that have never shot over hundred yards. If you learn, if you teach them how to do it right, the right process. I basically teach the same process that we use for ELR at two miles that they can do at 600. And they get incredible performance after a couple of weeks. Then they keep moving up until they shoot one mile and get first round hits all day long, which is with a 6.5, which is very impressive. And with the amount of knowledge they have, and if you add a little more experience and a good teamwork, you're ready to go to a field two miles. And we have those courses in, in our, based in Alabama on the Star Academy and on the CMP, Talladega. You, I don't know if you have shot down there, CMP. You know the place, the range? Yeah. Yeah. It's a fantastic range in CMP because it has the electronic target systems and it gives you a huge amount of feedback. And that's very important for the shooter because, for example, you are with a Kestrel. That's something I do with the shooters all the time. You're with a Kestrel. And uh, you see a difference in the in the wind. If you shoot and you want to see the, the impact at that distance, you will have to go to the target. With with the system, you just see the difference, see how the movement of the air affects your shot. And you, as soon as you shoot, you see it on the electronic uh, target system. Okay, this wind moved my my shot half a millimeter to the right. So you start learning, and that's the whole point. The more you learn, the better you become in reading the wind, and then you can advance to open fields instead of a, a typical range, and then you advance to different winds, and it's it's a it's an ever learning process. I mean, actually, I tell everybody that anybody that tells you that he knows how to shoot in the wind is a liar. The wind is always the winner. I mean, you can shoot one day, then you get really frustrated, and you don't get. Of course, I'm talking over a lot. And there are some days that you go back home crying, but that's the way it is. It's nature. Yeah. So right. the, the best you can do is train a lot, learn a lot from the use of all the information you have, like the Kestrel and the targets, and every shot you take, see how it the wind affected your, your point of impact. That's the way to train yourself to shoot in the wind. 
Nice. Well, as we wrap up here, um, to be a good Kestrel uh, uh, proponent here, I saw you had a HUD on your rifle. That's something that's new that we came out with uh, earlier in the year that a lot of people haven't seen yet. Maybe you could tell us how you use that. How is that helping you at King of Two Mile? Actually, actually the HUD is uh, that my problem with, uh, actually the HUD, my, my logic shouldn't be very interested in a HUD. And until I realized that uh, with, with my aging sight, uh, I struggle to see some numbers under stress when they are, when they are very close. And then I, re I, I said, okay, I, I will try the HUD. And then I realized how convenient it was because you can change all the parameters on your rifle while on the firing line without moving. I'm very obsessive with movement. Every time you move on the rifle, you're changing things. And that's one of the, we go back to the fundamentals. Uh, every time you move, you change stuff. The, your positional uh, between the scope, and there's a lot of problems that can happen. So I try not to move from the rifle. So I realized that having the HUD in front of me in the rifle was super convenient because then I could actually get all my stuff together and just one hand lowers the rifle and I'm absolutely concentrated and not taking my eye from the target anytime and uh, it's I found that it's I'm actually I said how, how did they invent this before <laughs> because it was very good I have been doing like a small tables for years but they were not dynamic and the problem with the LR is that the, your shoot your shots are always dynamic what you shot on target two is not the same in target three, which is a little different for other types of competitions, which is basically, you are basically shooting the same things on most targets. Once you get past one mile, you have to be very dynamic. So basically you will have to adjust your ballistics. And every time you get, get up and start discussing with your, with, your, with your spotter, you are degrading your performance. So having it, everything just in front of you, attached to the rifle that you just stretch your, your, your arm and change the wind, change, it's very, very convenient. Nice. Well, I'm glad that's working for you. Yeah, um, it really works. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're excited for that one. It's been a long time coming to market. We're happy to have it. Um, well, Eduardo, I wanted to thank you for being willing to come on with us and talk. This has been a great discussion. I've learned a lot about King of Two Mile. Like I said, I, I've seen it. I've kind of it's it popped up on Facebook. I've read about it a little bit, but um, it's very cool to see what goes into making that work and what you guys have done taking that from kind of that smaller sport and growing now and going international. It's very cool. Um, I'm excited to see what comes of this. And that. Where do you see King of Two Mile in in five years? What do you think it's going to turn into? As long as we can all get back to shooting matches together, we are going to to become. I mean, actually. We are already a global sport. Um, I always thought that not, not a single group of people or a single company could spend the amount of, of uh, mental uh, capacity or uh, budget to develop systems for us. It was too expensive. Not even the military could do it. So, but now we have hundreds of very smart people all around the world and very smart companies trying to make the best they can to make equipment for us to shoot that far. So what I see is more people coming into the sport, seeing that it's incredibly exciting to get so, techno so technology obsessive, getting so your fundamentals so correct that you release a perfect shot every time and get all those pieces, get them together. And people get so excited all around the world that I see that we are going to start hitting consistently a few miles very soon and then we'll push it farther ahead. We are going to shoot very, very far. Oh, cool. Well, I'll be uh, excited to see where this goes. Um, hopefully one day I can make it out and go shooting with you. Uh, it's, it's hard to find a range. Time, we, we, should do, we should talk about these things. I mean, this is a, it's a little complicated to explain all those little subtleties uh, of the wind and, and uh, how, I, how I call the wind, depending on where it comes, uh, uh, talking onto a screen. But if, you, if you, we can do it one day, we could go to the to a range and talk about it on the range, because that would be way more interesting. Yeah, no, it'd be very cool. We're up in uh, southeast Pennsylvania. It's a little hard to find ranges that stretch out that far, but when we get the chance, ah. we'd love to do it. 
Come, come to the King of Tomas in Red Town, or we, you can come to Alabama. We no, will, we'll I, go I, shooting. I, I'd love to come down and hit one of those events with you. Anyway, come thank you so much for giving us the time. <laughs> thank you again for, for the time. Glad you could make uh, be flexible to meet with us. And, uh, and thanks so much. Appreciate it. No problem. No problem. All right. See you. Thank you very much. Bye.